What's up, rockers? Welcome to another episode of the Talk Louder podcast, where we geek out on all things rock and roll. Hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Leave us your likes and comments. You can also leave likes and comments on our Facebook page. Follow us on iTunes, Spotify, Instagram at TalkLouder underscore podcast. And of course, our website, TalkLouderPodcast.com, where you'll find links to our merch and all of our 100 plus previous episodes. I'm Metal Dave Glessner, along with my co-host, Jason McMaster. And today's guest is Jeff Scott Soto, vocalist extraordinaire. And um, while he's not exactly a household name, I think you'd be hard pressed to find anybody who would argue that he's not one of the better singers in the hard rock genre. He's he's, like, he's incredible. I'm going to interrupt you. He yeah. is completely in- incredible. He can sing any style. He's obviously a metal singer. Yeah. But he's he sings in soul and funk and disco bands and just good hard rock. He's he's very good uh like ballad type stuff. He has that kind of a thing. His resume is out of this world yeah. and I can't keep up. Exactly. Uh, I know he's on to... everything and I'm lear- every seems like every day I learn something new about this guy. Right. Uh so you know, I, 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 I need to confess here. I just looked up on his, uh, uh, you know, his Wikipedia. I, I'm confessing. I'm confessing that I do that. I don't always do that because I just didn't want to miss anything. Because this is a rare opportunity. Yeah. This is going to blow your mind unless you did the same and you're just not fessing up. He apparently, according to Wiki, he sang backup on our producer. Jared Tootin's band's record, Pariah to Mock a Killing Bird. I did not know that. Wow. That's fucked up that I did not wow. know that. Now, yeah. we're about to ask him a bunch of questions, and that's going to be one of them. Right. Uh, so, might as well state the obvious. He first came on to your ears and your record player as the voice on Ingve Malmsteen's Rising Force. Yes. And then the second record, of course, marching out with right. I Am a Viking and such and such and continued to blow minds. I ran into him in Los Angeles. Uh, Watchtower, we got to open for Ingve. That's when I met him. There's this crazy photo floating around recent uh, of me and him from 37 years ago, that yeah. Ingve gig, and then just a couple of days ago. Uh, he's always been really sweet. He's one of the nicest guys in the business that I've ever met. And he just, uh, I can't wait to talk to him. Yeah. Um, it's, he's one of those guys, like you said, his resume is incredible and it's so wide ranging that I, there's no way we're going to miss a few bands today. I'm just going to come clean right now. There's just no way to cover it all, but we're going to hit on a lot of the highlights and, and some of the lesser known things like, wow, Pariah did not know that. And I got a couple of questions up my sleeve that I want to ask him. Well, and I just want to get to the bottom of, because I can't, I can drop these names and I can say, I'm pretty sure that I saw him on like American Idol doing backup vocals for Queen. Oh, right. Uh, He's also had a short time with Journey. Who can say that? That's a small (laughs) club. So why don't we, why don't we stop wasting time and just let him in the room? Uh, ladies and gents and germs, Mr. Jeff Scott Soto on the Talk Louder podcast. Jeff, thanks for joining us today. It's nice to meet you. Um, I, w- I wanted to first say, uh, I-, I just wanted to extend condolences to you on the recent passing of your father. I know that had to be very difficult for you and your family. And, uh, I, I appreciate you joining us, and I'm sending you peace and strength from Austin, Texas, to you and all your family. So, uh, much obliged, man. Thank you. That means yeah, a lot. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, you bet. And uh, so, I wanted to start by saying, um, you sent me an email. You responded to my email, and I had mentioned to you that I saw you uh, perform on uh, the Rising Force tour with Ingve Malmsteen uh, in 1985, and you wrote back and you said it's always great to talk to someone who saw me when I was 19 years old and my mind was blown. <laughs> I was like, and then I stopped and I did, I stopped and I did the math and I thought, 
well, okay, yeah, I just would have never thought of it. But you're 19 years old making a name for yourself with Ingve Malmstein. And I got a little show and tell today. Um, I have. Oh, amazing. My 1985 Rising Force tour shirt from the Sunken Garden Theater in San Antonio. That Obvi- is amazing. Yeah, I obviously can't wear it anymore. <laughs> You've got a little schmutz on the uh, on the shirt there too. I don't know. I don't even want to say what it looks like. Now, it might now we know what he's using it for. Since he can't wear it, he's you know he's got it close yeah, well, by at all times. Let's just say it's in the bathroom and he uses it to wipe the toothpaste off his face. That, that's a little paper. Perfect. <laughs> you know. This is what I get for bringing my city show and tell to the show. There you go. Uh, oh, there actually, you go. Actually, it hangs on a spot on the wall over here. And, uh, you know, I can't wear it, but I, I refuse to throw it away because it was such a great memory. So tell us, how did you at age 19 meet Ingve Malmstein, who at the time was a kid himself? Let's let's remember. Uh, how did you guys meet and how did you get that gig and how did that all get started? Well, since you, uh, I mean, you, it was your first mistake by saying that you guys sometimes can go three hours with your uh, with your podcast here because that's, I'll try to give you the abridged version, but okay. there, really, there really isn't one. There, I, I have to, you can, the details are actually the, the fun part about this story. Um, it started, I was, um, I was in a cover band in Colorado and um, I, I literally, I, I moved out there to hang out with my buddy <clears throat> after high school, my band Canaan, I was in, broke up. And he said, hey, come out and visit me out here. We went to school together. He moved back to Colorado. He says, a great cover band out here. I need a singer and you'd be great for it. And I go, yeah, you know what? I'll go. I have nothing going on right now. I'm, I'm, I'm already hitting my my uh, my midlife crisis at the age of 18. I, I think I wasn't even 18 yet. I think I was still 17. Wow. Um, so I moved to Colorado to be with him, live with him and to not to be with him and to start into this band. And it was great in the beginning. We were doing tons of gigs. We were booked everywhere, you know, doing everything from Scorpions to Kiss to Dio, Maiden, Van Halen. It was a lot of fun. And uh, and then the gigs started drying up. And so I thought, you know what? I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm wasting my time with doing cover songs. I should go back home to L.A. And uh, just before I was heading back home, I remember being at a, another buddy's house. We were just watching MTV and just hanging out, drinking pop and eating potato chips. The guys went upstairs, used the bathroom, whatever. I was I stayed in the basement in front of the TV. And I remember on MTV, I remember Mark Goodman coming on and said, on the MTV News, Ingve Malmsteen, Swedish guitar player, has left the band Alcatraz and he's looking for a new singer. And it could be you. I remember that finger pointing right in the camera. Wow. And I'm the only one in the room going, whoa, because I love Ingve. I love that Alcatraz album. I even liked his band with, I loved his work on the Steeler album. Yeah. So I, used yeah. To play, I used to introduce Ingbe's playing to everybody. Just say, you got to hear this guy. It's just, this is like a demon with fingers, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I love that and description. So, so to hear that he was out of the band looking for a singer, it's like, oh man, that's going to be so cool. Whoever gets that gig. My buddies came back. I told them what I just witnessed on MTV. I even kind of in the back of my head, I kind of memorized the address of where to send your your stuff to. My buddy's like all over me, dude, you got to send your tape. You got to send your demo. They love my band, Kanan, the one that broken up just before, uh, just after high school. And they, they love the demo. And they said, you got to send that demo to them. You got to send it like, dude, I'm so broke right now. I can't even afford the dollar 33. It's going to cost it to send this L.A. You, you know the drill. We're young, starving musicians. And that's that was our motivation. And children. We're children. So anyway, my exactly yeah. grown yeah. children. Yeah. So my buddy basically said, dude, we're going down to the post office tomorrow. I'm going to loan you the money. We're going to send your demo. There's no ifs, ands or buts. We even took a, a couple of Polaroids because I, I didn't have any promos. I, I don't I didn't know anything about this world of promotion and, you know, getting band photos and all that stuff. It was still so new to me. I was just out of high school. And um, so we sent a couple of Polaroids and my and my cassette. And I remember I didn't remember the exact zip code i remember the address was something like six thousand uh west sunset boulevard hollywood california but we literally went to the post office and looking in a big directory of with that address oh shit, is this east or is this west uh, doesn't matter i'm just going to choose one and luckily the uh the cassette sent and it was received now a week and a half later i believe i was back at my mom's and moved back in back back in the home and uh and um i got a call I just got a call one morning from Ingve's secretary or Ingve's manager. I don't remember which one saying they got my tape and Ingve would love to meet me. Thank God I was back in L.A. at the time. Yeah. Uh, 
this is where it gets fun. So I went down to the, they said, come down to the studio this weekend. He's, uh, he's, he's finishing up his first the solo album. He's working on his album. And so I went down there, walk into the room. I thought it was going to be a greeting, like, hello, you know, nice to meet you. It was not, none of that. It was Ingve just stood, sat behind the uh, console with the guitar engineers. Engineer said, hey, give us a, a few minutes. We're going to finish this solo and then Ingve will get right to you. So I just sat back and I'm just going, man, if anything I get out of this, I got, I'm going to meet Ingve Malmsteen and I'm witnessing him playing a solo on his new album. This is pretty badass. <laughs> So about 20 minutes later, they finish. Ingve takes me over to one of the uh, isolation booths. And guitar is as far as the, it looked like Guitar Center puked in that room because there's just every. So he picks up a, an acoustic guitar and he just starts playing, just like noodling around. He goes, "Okay, hmm, so what do we do here?" And he starts playing, ding, 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 and then he's playing. Okay, this is a verse. I guess this is where you sing. Come up with something. He says, "Don't take it, don't 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 take it." He starts playing me the chords. So I'm like on the fly, just coming up with ideas what to sing over that. And then I I got a pen and paper and I started writing down some mock lyrics just to have something to sing. And he goes, "I have something for the chorus. I will never die because I will fly." And I, I I wrote that down. I sang it a couple times with him for like 15 minutes. He goes, "Man, yeah, this sounds good. Okay, let's go track it." Uh huh. <laughs> I didn't realize it was something he'd already recorded that's going to be for that album. So they put the tape up. I'm like this and like just shaking profusely in the uh, in the vocal booth. And I could see them behind the glass. It's like just out of the scene, Rockstar, the movie. I'm standing behind the glass and I could see the manager, the engineers and Ingve, and uh, they play me the songs. Like, man, this sounds great. This is badass. They get my mic level. I got my mock lyrics, my mock melodies, and I just start doing it. Just one take high notes and I, ah, all that shit. So I did the whole thing. Uh, the song ends and I see the managers jumping up and down like a gorilla. I was like, dude, what's going on here? And Ingve's just sitting there cool as a cucumber as, as, as you would expect. And he says, okay, yeah, come on in. Uh, bottom line is he said, it sounds really good. Listen, I, I, I need to finish this. Maybe you should come by the house. I've got, I've got a home recording studio. I've got some demos. Maybe we can work on and chisel out. And that was my life for the next three weeks. Every day I went to Ingve's house. We worked on I'll See the Light Tonight, um, Caught in the Middle, Disciples of Hell. We worked, I'm a Viking, all that stuff we did right there in his home. We were demoing those songs. And three weeks, I'm like, man, he's not letting up at all. He's not showing any enthusiasm, any, he's not even telling me if they're looking at other people. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if I have this gig. And then finally, it was the night before he was supposed to go in and do the vocals for those two songs on the uh, first album. He said uh, that I, I remember the band were they were talking in, in, in Swedish and everything. And that's when that was the night I was officially inducted as a singer. And they just they were blowing me off for almost an hour. I'm like, God, I feel so left out. So finally, Ingve comes over, he goes, look, you're the singer in the band now. And tomorrow I'm going into the studio to, to sing the vocals. But the guys convinced me that you should be singing on there because you're the singer. So take these two songs home tonight, learn them, meet you at the studio tomorrow at 11 o'clock in the morning. If you sound good, good on it, we use your voice. If it's not going to work, I'll sing them. And then we, we worry about the next album. Wow. And I was like, done. I took those two songs. I stayed up all night listening and learning. We, I went in the studio the next morning and we did As Above, So Below as the first one. And then uh, Now Your Ships Are Burn as the second one. And there's the history of how it all began. And wow. may I just jump in and go, you fucking killed it. <laughs> yeah. Dude, like, thank you for that. And it's it's funny. It's funny now because I I listen to myself. And of course, this is normal for us. Yeah, I'm sure, Jason, you, you probably listen like, to old Watchtower stuff and go, God, I, that's how I sounded and you almost wonder where were the vocal police at the time to, to tell me, no, 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 don't do that. Don't sing like that. Not you necessarily, but me, because I listen to it now and I, it sounds humorous to me. It sounds almost comedic because mm. that was one of my biggest struggles when I joined Ingbe is I didn't feel I had an identity. I didn't feel I had an identifiable voice yet. You know, when you hear Freddie Mercury, you hear one note, you know, it's Freddie. You hear Steve Perry, one note, you know, it's Freddie. So all, all the way down the line, so many singers like this, they have their stamp, but then there are some it's like, is that Brian Johnson or is that Tom Kiefer? You know, you start, you start, yeah. thinking it could be other people when it's not them. Right. And that's what I didn't want in this business. So 
to try and mold, to try to find some kind of identity with my own voice, I thought this is Ingve, this is metal. Let me see if I can combine Dio and Dickinson into one voice. And I was basically emulating those two singers. They were my two favorite metal singers at the time. And I thought if I emulate them in my head, I sound just like them. But obviously I listen back now, I'm like, oh God, why, would, why did I sing like that? Because <laughs> I wish I had sung those songs the way I sing now. I, I think it would have had more, of, it certainly would have had more identity, it, but it is what of, it is. Yeah, it's part of your, it's part of the journey to become you. Yeah. And yeah. you don't know that when you're a kid. And and maybe I'm not telling you that you must have been intimidated, but, you know, with you walk in and it's like, you know, you're in Disneyland and you're Absolutely. like fish out of water, kind of like, whoa, this is a lot to take in right now. Absolutely. And like every day at Ingve's house, it's like, holy shit, you don't even know if you're in the band yet. Right. So all of this crazy shit. And then you're OK, ready, spotlight on you now. Go red lights on tapes rolling. You're like, holy fuck, you know, <laughs> right. so so I, I was I've been biting my tongue through this whole story. And Sorry, then you got to that. No, it's fine. That was a great story. I, yeah, I loved it. That's the best. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so I, usually, I, I usually tell like the the four minute abridged version. So, but it was well, your mistake by saying, "Hey, we go as no, long as we go." No, it's that's great. Exactly so, what we want so on the show. here's where I'm going with it. When I when I think about those early Ingve songs with you singing, I'm like, I hear so many things. I hear, I hear. Ingve's influence upon that style of neo sure. neoclassical metal. Sure. Therefore, I'm feeling like if you didn't sing like that, whatever, right. like that, how, whoever, however you want to describe it, what color that is, what, sure. whoever you're emulating, like you say, dude. But I hear everyone from that style. I sure, hear, sure. Ian, I hear Ian Gillen. I hear Graham Bonnet. I hear, I hear Gary Barden. You know who? Wow. From the, I, from I the, used to get a, that early on. Yes, a, a little bit. He doesn't have the grit that you right. have, but you know, I like Gary Barton because he's more like he's a Joe Lynn Turner kind of sure. a guy. He's more uh -huh. of a Joe guy, right? Commercial and a nice, a clean voice. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, but can lend itself to you know songs that are. Side. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, I, I could talk about it for a long time, but I. I'm so glad that you sang like that, even though you you probably felt uh, naked or not. You, you were you were just guessing, you know. Yeah. I, I'm really glad that you sang that way because it gave a fan us something to like. Oh, that sounds like Jeff Scott Soto. Whenever we heard something else that lend it, to, oh, that guy's right, trying right. to be Jeff Scott Soto, or and now we know who you were just emulating you were emulating your heroes which is how everyone starts anyway well you know so, what i still have that audition that first audition i have i had it they sent me home with it on cassette and since then i've transferred it digitally i still have it and listening to that this is what i'm talking about when i listened back to that that's when i realized oh that voice ain't gonna cut it i'm surprised i got the gig singing that way but i wanted to beef it up and that's why i went the other route when the version you hear on the final album you can hear the difference even between the two of those because one they, they were literally sung and done within a month and a half of each other it wasn't like a year or many months or mm -hmm. a couple of years where your voice starts maturing as you're still mm -hmm. at that age but i could hear the the level of not necessarily growth but in terms of i was really trying to hone in on something that will become my identity later on down okay. the line and when I listen to that, then I really, really say, oh, my God, I'm so lucky I even got this gig in the first place. Someday I'll play it for you. You got it. It's kind of fun to listen to. I was still 18 at the time because this was August of. Yeah, it was August of uh, 84. OK. And then I was officially inducted into a band like maybe a month and a few days later in September of 84. And that's when I went into the studio to, to sing those two vocals. So I was still 18. I turned 19 in November. So it's really cool to be able to still say that I was 18 years old when I sang on the first Ingve album. Damn, man, that that's, is crazy. That's pretty that cool. That's awesome. <laughs> that you were, I mean, but how old was Ingve? We yeah. were all kids. Ingve himself yeah. was only, I think he was 20 or 21 at the time. Okay. Uh, I remember uh, Jens Johansson and Marcel, I think, were both 20. And the 
the drummer Anders was the oldest one in the band. He was 22 going on 23. Mm -hmm. So when you think of 23 now, it's like I have a 22 year old step, uh, my my stepson. Mm -hmm. I have a 34 year old son. And I think of 23 was the oldest guy in Rising Force when we (laughs) launched. It's it's mind blowing. Yeah, it's mind blowing when you think of that age and how young and inexperienced and green we were. And then as as we were talking about what you said, Jason, and you get kind of thrown into the lion's den of overwhelmness. And then the tour begins, then, then begins the, now you have to deliver this live. I don't know anything about if my voice can carry simultaneous or, you know, uh, consistent nights in a row. I don't know how my voice is going to work when I'm sick. I never had to deal with that. When you're in a cover band or any other band, you're playing on weekends or you have time in between to kind of heal and, and you don't even realize or understand the idea of, singing every night on the on the road and on tour uh that comes later that comes with experience as we all know but um my first outing with Ingbe was in january here in in california we we did we did two shows in california one in socal one in nocal and then we embarked on the japanese tour now the famous live in 85 video live from tokyo that was we did three shows in in Japan, and that was the third night that we played. So in all, I had four shows total under my belt with Ingbe and the guys before we shot that home video. And imagine that pressure of massive stage, massive audience. It's going to be released on home video, and this is only five shows in. May I, I inter- may I, inter- I, may I interrupt? So cool. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just want to don't want to forget this, and okay. just so for listeners and people watching and stuff. When you're only four or five shows into your new band, right? You're you're wor- you've just you've just fessed up that you are you're claiming that your identity was almost zilch, so you had to create this over just a period of months, right? Week, weeks and months. Do you remember what what you did? You have any nervousness? Like, okay, well, oh. this this style of music, what am I going to wear? Did you have, oh, ever no. have any wardrobe nightmares oh, about boy. the first yeah. show? What the fu- what kind of music is this, and what am I going to wear as a front man for this without pissing the band off? They uh, put on retainer uh, the same guy that did the the clothing for Priest on the Turbo tour and Crocus when Crocus became these these colorful rag muffin ragamuffin outfits. That's that's the guy they assigned to us. That's why I'm wearing a pink shirt with lace going through it and blue leather pants. And yeah, we it, we were very col- colorful at the time. And Ingbe had he wanted nothing to do with it. Said, I'm the man in black. I'm going to do what Richie Blackmore does. I'm just going to wear the, the black spandex and the black leather and just just going to be cool. And I was the one that was thrown into you know <laughs> I, I, it was like a color form world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, you know, I was going to get to this, the whole touring thing, because that had to be new for you as well. So besides just the demands on your voice and trying to find your stage legs, so to speak, uh, how difficult is it for you at the age of 18, 19 to, to, to be out on the road, just living out of a suitcase at that young age for the first time? Yeah, you know what? That's that's all par for the course. It's so exciting. You're It's something you dreamed of, something you work for. I don't want to say all your life because you, at that point you don't have much life to to actually say you've lived. So that's, those are all the early stages and the, uh, the, everything that you've been working and dreaming about. And so again, it's a bit of an outer body experience in the fact that you don't really soak it all in and absorb it all in the way you can do later. Once you've actually got those sea legs, you know, transformed. Once you actually know what you're doing, you know the drill, you know how the bus works, you know how the, the etiquette, see everything about going on the road. Once you get that part down, you can actually start enjoying it. You can actually start uh, reeling it in and, and soaking in all the memories. Back then, it was just so overwhelming. It was like a wedding day every day. You know, Any, anybody who's ever been married, your wedding day is a big blur because it's, it's just one massive party with everybody you know and love. And at the end of the day, you're going, I have no idea what just happened. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Wow, man. What a what a lot to to handle at such a young age. And uh so okay, uh we got a lot to cover with you, but I, I and and I could talk about Ingve all day, but so why did it eventually end? What happened? Um, yeah, you know what? When I I kinda had delusions of grandeur in joining Ingve, I, I started the situation and we were kind of 
roped into the situation with the ideal that it was going to be a band. It was going to be, yes, it would have been Ingve Mousey's Rising Force kind of designed after the Richie Blackmore's uh, Rainbow. We realized that, but we thought our identities and our input would be a little more important. And I'm not going to, um, this is not a dig against Ingve, it's not a dig against the people who were, you know, taking care of him and looking after him. But it's more of, I guess it's my own fault that I thought it was going to become more of a unit. I thought it was going to become something I could grow with. When I saw it wasn't, when the whole marquee aspect of it all was Ingve, 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 when you realize that, the, you know, clearly in the beginning, especially all the fans were there to see him. They don't know me from Adam. They don't know the rest of the band from Adam. We were kind of delegated the the role of just being, you know, puppets, so to speak. And again, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. I just mean that in, in, the, in terms of we were hired guns. And I, all my life in any band I've ever been in, I've always been accustomed to the one for all, all for one mentality. When I realized this was one for one, I thought this is not something I can grow with. I, I, and there were a lot of other little teeny things that became bigger things later that I just said, I, this is not for me. Um, as much as it was great to, to be with Ingve and to tour and do all that, I basically got another offer. I got an offer from uh, when Rudy and Tommy left Ozzy's band and they started, they were starting a new band. They, they had at that time, Mark St. John from Kiss on guitar. And I thought, this is amazing. You got a guy from Kiss, these two guys who I love and respect from Ozzy. And, uh, and they're asking me to sing for him. And this is going to be a, a cohesive band, a unit that we're growing and we're building and we're creating together, as opposed to everything we're doing is going to be taking credit for one person through one person. And that's really the reason I left. You, when you add all the other things that were kind of piled on from, um, I, again, I don't want to, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but no. the bottom line is we were treated rather poorly. We were treated rather disrespectfully. And from that, I wanted to kind of up my own game and I left the band to, to pursue something with Tommy and Rudy, which once it was official, that, that lasted all of three months for me. And then I was back to the drawing board of starting my own thing again until 1986, when I was uh, asked to return to Ingve. basically Mark Bowles who replaced me. Um, I guess Ingve was having some issues. I don't, I don't remember what it was at the time, but they asked me if I would finish out the tour that ended in 87. And that's why I came back and, and I was, I wasn't let go again. I think it was just, I, I was only there to finish that tour out. And it was uh, shortly after that, that Ingve was in a really bad wreck. And uh, from that, oh, once he recovered, right. the whole Jolyn Turner thing came about. And that's, you know, again, it's, that's history. It's how it worked out. Interesting, <laughs> in interesting sidebar yeah. for a second, yeah. not to go off. Uh, no, they, no, no. Re they recorded that record with Joe uh, in Austin, Texas. Oh, wow. And, uh, Anders and Yens were, were, well, fuck, the whole band would go down to this club called The Back Room. And I was still in Watchtower, but I had started moonlighting with these guys. Oh, you know, Dangerous Toys, maybe you heard of them. Yeah. So, <laughs> so they, so, you know, and it was just a, it was a cover band that we, I wrote a couple songs with them and we were fucking around and I was only in the band six months. And during that six months, time period before we were discovered or whatever that's when they were recording that Ingve record in austin texas and they were all coming to this club that we okay. were we were the big fish in a little pond we were we were the house band at this this bar right and they would come drinking after studio they would oh, wow. they would they would shut down this club that we played at every weekend and so those guys remembered me from watchtower and even Anders and Jens came over to a Watchtower rehearsal and hung out. And it was like, wow, this is crazy. And when you think about from 85 to 80, 87, 87. it's like that's a, a flash yeah, in time. Exactly. It's so fast. Yeah. And um, it was like, whoa, it's crazy. And, and uh, yeah, Anders would get up and jam with the toys. Mark would hand him his sticks mid-song. And Anders would go, oh. Okay, and he'd play because we were playing Zeppelin uh, and whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. And uh, and it was just a weird, crazy time. So we were not discovered yet. So the next time I ran into Anders and them, I'm in Toys, and it's like, oh my God, you guys, or or you know, they saw us on MTV or some shit. Right. And then the next time I ran into you was close to the same time, maybe eighty eight or eighty nine, 
and you had eyes and you gave right. me a cassette a cassette of eyes we were at you know i don't know bar cat house or exposure 54 or something we were we were out and i ran in you know i was like dude i, I was probably jumping up and down freaking out because i was such a fan of yours that's what but... we do say again that's what we did. We jumped yeah. up and down with well, excitement. We were young and we were excited to, to, you know, I hope he remembers me. Yay, he remembers right, me. Right, right, right. Yay, we can be friends. So, oh my God. Um, dude. And we're kind of, we're, we're kind of, we're kind of stepping over that. If you, we need to go back and discuss when we actually met because we, you know, you watched yeah. Tower open okay. for when we, yep. and yep. in 85. And, and that I ties have to, in with Dave. It, that ties in with Dave seeing you in San Antonio, which had uh, to have right, been right. the day after or two exactly. days Maybe after. Before, it right. had to be the same week. Yeah, the Texas run exactly. Yeah. And and I and one of the reasons I distinctly remembered you was because we did have quite a few. It was very rare that we had a third band or that we were in the midst of other bands because that tour was strictly Talis, which was Billy Sheen's band opening the support mm -hmm. band, mm -hmm. and and us in Inver. And it was rare that we would have other bands or a festival setting or that kind of thing. Locals. Where, where, the where they local. would add a third or fourth yeah. band. Local yeah. flavor. And, but I do remember, and again, no disrespect to anybody who opened for us, so I'm not going to name names, but most of them stunk. And so from that, I remember watching Watchtower and going, damn, these guys are onto something. I remember you lanky and lean, just delivering, just doing your thing, man. And I'm like, these, these guys are badass. One of the reasons why you left an impact, one of the reasons why I remembered you. And, well, and then, and, and then we have this, remember this? Yeah. Yes, of <laughs> course I do. Yeah. yeah. You just that... sent it to me and that's, you know, that was it. That was the beginning. Yeah. That yeah, it was crazy. Was, when is that photo taken, 85? Uh, it's, it's the same. Look at your shirt. Yeah, it was the day before or day after. Right. Yeah. Are there dates exactly. on your shirt or just yeah, cities? Yeah, yeah, Are yeah, there yeah. dates or, or cities? Yeah, they should be the cities in the back. Drum roll, please. Yeah, I'm going to need my glasses. Good. Oh, put, them, boy. put them on, baby. Look what we've become. Put Hang on, on a second. Let me get my glasses. Yeah, put them on. San Antonio, June 22nd. Austin, June 23rd. Okay. Look at that that Look photo at was that. taken June 23rd, 1985. 1985. So I saw Jeff first. You did. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Here we tough, go. Tough room. <laughs> hey, so, Jeff, tell me, uh, I had no idea. What what happened with the band with uh, Rudy and Tommy and Mark St. John? I, yeah, I that, no I've idea. never heard that. Well, unfortunately, that pr that project became a revolving door of singers and guitar players. And I love Tommy and Rudy to this day. Rudy's one of my dear friends. And he's one of the people that I met early on in my career and in, in my the beginning of this stages of my life and career uh, professionally. And he's one of the, the, the only ones that stayed as true to that person that I met 37 years ago, mm, whatever it was. I get that. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, it's a rarity yeah. that uh, I've seen, I've seen even uh, cover band singers get bloated egos. It's like, guys, come on, man. We're, we're just, we all have the same mission and same goal in life. Just be cool and be, just be a dude. Let's just hang. You don't need all that other, you know, LSD bullshit. That lead singers disease shit. Right. But anyways, uh, the the thing with uh, with those guys is Mark St. John. I don't know for whatever reason, I was I went back out to finish the Ingbe tour, and during the tour, I came back or they informed me that Mark was out, and they were working on the guy that replaced Ingbe in Steeler, a guy named Kurt James. It's a great guitar player. He was wow. in a band called Black Sheep here in L.A. That was one of those uh, famous in L.A. only bands. And everybody yeah. in L.A. knew of them, but they could never get signed in a major way. And think, every great guitar player came through that band as well. I think even I think Paul Gale was in that band. Slash uh, was in that band. Yeah, exactly. Minute, yeah. Right. Yeah. So from Kurt James was now the uh, replacement for uh, Mark St. John. And the whole demographic of the music changed because Mark, th those guys weren't writers at the time. They were collaborators in terms of whatever the guitar player was bringing in musically. So obviously Mark took his songs and then the next, the next batch of songs came from Kurt, uh, Kurt James. And so I started working on stuff on that stuff and it was really cool. We, we came up with some really cool stuff, but then uh, along the way there, they said, um, Kurt's not going to work out. We need somebody 
with a, with a name, with an image, blah, blah, blah. And so I talked my friend Craig Goldie into leaving Jafria to join us. Wow. <laughs> and then Goldie brought in a whole new set of songs that now all of a sudden were not really in my personal wheelhouse. I, it was a little too rainbow, deep purple for my taste. Mm -hmm. I thought we were trying to do something a little more modern for that time uh, instead of something that was kind of a, a revamped version of what those guys did in the 70s. And so those guys felt that, that there was kind of a rub. It was kind of an awkwardness, my participation. And then I was let go. Wow. Then they got another singer and then, then uh, Goldie left. And then they got another guitar player and then that singer left it. Basically it was a revolving doors on a revolving door situation until they finally ended up with Tony McAlpine and Rob Rock. And they recorded an album called Mar the project Mars. It's McAlpine, uh, Aldridge, uh, rock, Rob, 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 Rob Rock. Yeah. And Sarzo Mars. Yeah. Yeah. So they did that on shrapnel. It basically the whole, uh, the whole idea of this is going to be a super group on a massive label with big, push and everything turned up to they recorded on a, on an indie with you know low budget and then the the project just went away yeah mm -hmm. yeah wow i that's interesting i had no idea about that uh that phase of your uh your your past uh because there's a lot of potential in that room man oh yeah <laughs> so oh, no, I, been... I mean i was excited as a fan of rudy's sure. and tommy's work with what, them, but what year would that have been that you got that was in 85, 85? I, well, I left oh. in, oh, right. okay. my last show with ingbe was in May. Oh wait, no. If the shirt said June, that the end of that run was the, the end for me with Ingve and uh, the first end of phase one of my time with them. That Did was you, the end of that year. Wait, so that was that would was uh, so that was not marching out. So marching, he well, he toured marching out without you. Yes. Well, here's Damn the it. thing. We recorded marching out literally right after we, they finished mixing the first album. We, oh, we were already okay, working on Marching Out. We recorded, I did my my last vocal of Marching Out on New Year's Eve of 1984. Wow. Oh, wow. So they, they planned to rush the album, to mix it, rush it out, I'd say like February or March before the actual US tour was, in European tour was about to start. It was too late to get it out before the Japanese tour because that was in January of 85. And then news came in that Ingve's first album got nominated for a Grammy, in Best Instrumental Album. And so, this is where Polygram stepped in. They said, hold the phone. We're not releasing this band album until the cycle, until after the Grammy. So they pushed marching out to August, but we were still doing the majority of material live. People mm -hmm. never heard this stuff, but we were right. still doing all those songs for marching out as well as a couple of Al Alcatraz songs, et cetera. And that's how we toured. And now I left the band before marching out came out. Wow. So of course this is now step in Mark Bowles who had to sing, he had to mime to my voice in the video because he was promised, just sing the video, just mime it now. We're gonna go into the studio, change the voice to yours and then we're gonna lock it into the video later. Well, guess what they didn't do? They didn't go back into the studio, nobody cared <laughs> enough. And he got stuck with my voice coming out of his mouth on the video. Oh, and it's uh, to this day, I'm sure he hates it. He, I yeah. would hate it too. Yeah, it's kind of like yeah. the, uh, the, the the rock star. And I did the rock star movie, and to see the singer on stage miming to my voice, it's it's kind of awkward. But yeah. that's a different scenario. I mean, that's a movie. That's sure. That's how real life. I, like, I don't know was, how I forgot that you did a bunch of the vocal tracks for the movie Rock Stars, yes, dude. That's did. a fucking another feather in your totally. dude. You got a big ass hat. Yeah, because it's yeah. got a lot and a of big ass. <laughs> 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 no, your hat has all these fine fine plumage a lot, yeah. of, a lot of feathers in your cap no dude i mean i i'm so blessed i i i count my lucky stars every day because again we're it, deep down uh, three of us we're musicians we all had a dream we all had a vision we all had an idea of what we wanted out of the music we love the music we're creating and so for me to be able to to have the bragging rights to say I've sung for Journey and Trans Siberian Orchestra, the Soul Circus, Talisman, Ingve, Sons of Apollo. I mean, like the rock star thing. Everything when you look at that resume, it's it's so exciting for me to actually say I fulfilled that dream that I worked so hard and, and so long to to achieve. Yes. Yeah. I, I have rock star on my list of notes here, but go let's, Dave, let's go, go ahead. Dave, go we'll, we'll jump ahead to that. Uh, yeah. Rock star, uh, of course, the movie starring Mark Wahlberg and Jennifer Aniston, uh, supposedly loosely based on the story of Ripper Owens, who replaced Rob Halford and Judas Priest. A lot of people uh, 
you know, critically, that movie did not do very well. It got kind of panned. But I'll tell you, me and my wife love that movie. And we've probably watched it 25 times. And the one thing that people will say, even if they say the movie is cheesy, is they will all say the singing on that uh, soundtrack is incredible. Between you and uh, Mike from Steelheart, right? Uh, there are some amazing vocals. So tell everyone when they're watching that movie, what songs are you singing? When <laughs> you're singing stand up, right? I sing stand up on the, the first version of it. Obviously, Wahlberg's in the middle of the movie when he's actually replaced the singer in Steel Dragon and he's doing his version. That was Millie or Mike Matevic, whichever be, he goes by Millie now is his born name. Uh, and so that that song was sung three times in the movie. The very end, Miles Kennedy supplied his own vocals as well as starred in the role of replacing Wahlberg now in Steel Dragon. <clears throat> so the first version you hear in the beginning of the movie is my version. And I'm the voice of Bobby Beers, which is the original singer of Steel Dragon. The guy that pulls the wig off and and yeah. exclaims that he's really gay. Yeah. And um, and also the very first song that's playing it, when the credits are rolling, a song called Living the Life. That's also me. It's before the concert scene. Basically, the credits are rolling. You see the guys in the in the car and they pull alongside the pickup truck and they're rocking out. That's my voice in that song. I got one more on the movie soundtrack on the album, but not I don't think it appeared in the movie. It's a song called Wasted Generation. So I got a three. I got three total. Wow. And um, that I, I have to kind of go back to what you said about the movie not really resonating or finding its legs. I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that it came out the weekend before 9-11, because I remember distinctly being I had a gig in Florida. I flew out to Tampa that weekend before the gig that night on the Saturday night. We all went out. We, we The movie was just released. We went to go watch it in a the theater in the afternoon, a matinee, just to kind of get the feeling like, wow, this is what it's like to watch a movie that my voice is in, but just as a general public seater. Yes. And um, and so literally 9-11 happened days after. And I think, personally, I think that movie would have found a, a bit way bigger audience had it not been for the entire industry and the, the world basically shutting down after 9-11. Right, so right. It literally was days before. And the, the good news out of the whole thing is it did resonate on like VH1 classics, you know, you that basically that movie's always on those kind of channels and it did find a cult following audience. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why to this day I put stand up and shout or living the life in my life set, which whatever band I'm actually touring with. Yeah. I love the movie, man. I mean, me and my wife watch it all the time. We are great. Total, we're total suckers for that movie. Um, so how did you get that gig? How, how did, how did that all come about? I'll, tr I'll give you the abridged version of this. I, I, I don't want to, I don't want every story to be 20 minutes long and we, we miss covering a bunch of other stuff. Oh, they're fascinating um, stories though. Yeah, it, it's, it's fun to tell. And someday I'd love to write a book where I can detail all the uh, information. Um, I really good friends with the guys in Striper since, uh, since I joined Ingve since the, the first tour in 85, they used to come see us play. I used to go see them play. We became really, really close friends in 90 or 91. I forgot which year it was. They, they finally recorded their one and only secular album called Against the Law. And I remember Michael calling me and asking me if I would come and lend a hand with some backing vocals because they always did their own backing vocals. But when they sing, everything sounds so angelic. And they wanted this album to have a bigger statement and more of a tougher statement, but they wanted more punch with their backing vocals. So they asked me to come, come in and help them beef them up, and which I did. I sang backing vocals on every song and Tom Worman produced that album. And he... Basically, you know, that guy's great. I can use some other things. He basically took my information. And from that day forward, I think I sang background on every album he produced until he went into retirement. I remember doing Babylon AD, Lita Ford, Steelheart, uh, Pariah. Um, we, we did a, quite a few things. Hold the phone. So from that, yes. Hold the oh, phone hold on, real hold quick, on. real quick. Let's, let's come that, back to Pariah. Our producer, Pariah. Awesome. the producer of this show, is Jared Tootin. Jared Tootin is, oh, the, is the guitar player for of Pariah. Course, of course. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I, I didn't know that either until yep. a, yeah. about an hour ago. <laughs> yeah, it, that crazy. is just like that six degrees of separation Absolutely. working overtime right there. So I'm do sorry. I joke about it all the time, but I, you crazy. can actually do a six degrees of Jeff Scott Soto. I swear to God. Yeah. I am linked to basically everyone in the music industry. No it, one knows. No one knows this. Degree. No one knows that Kevin Bacon is your cousin. 
<laughs> so so yeah, Worman so gets your information, and you and you're be, he's keeping you busy. So he basically retired, I believe, in '96 or '97. I think the last album he did before retirement was the Pariah album. Oh. And well, from that there, been he, a, that would have been in '91 or '92. No, we're yeah, talking. Pariah, Pariah was '91 or '92. '92. To Maka Killing Bird, really? Yep. Yeah, somewhere around there. Uh, I'm gonna. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't think so. But I'm not. I'm gonna look it up so we can actually get that fact check. But the bottom I, line is, yep. he did retire. He bought a a B a B and B in in Maine or something like that, and he just didn't want to do anything to do with the music industry anymore until the Rockstar movie was made. And they realized this is a movie depicting the 80s. We need the top 80s producer to come in and do the soundtrack for us. So they, I don't know how they got Tom, but they talked him into it. And from there, when they were talking about singers for this, he said, well, one of the singers I'm putting in the hat is somebody I work with as a backing vocalist. I'm dying to work with him as a lead vocalist. And that's Jeff Scott Soto. And so it was from that, I was able to go in and kind of demo up a couple of the songs. Luckily, again, I had the, the backing of Zach uh, Jason Bonham, you know, Jeff Pilson, these are my buddies as well. And they were like, Jeff has got to do it. He's got, you know, so they basically, everybody was fighting for me. Nice. And I did sing all the songs. They wanted to hear where my voice fit mm -hmm. for the actual character. And in the end, they, they thought Jeff sounds too seasoned. He sounds too mature. So he should be the voice of the original singer. And we'll use Mativik's voice for Mark Alberg, who's the new guy. He sounds more youthful, more, uh, like he's still trying to find himself. Yeah. That's the voice that Mark, uh, that Mike was able to give to Mark. So that's how I was. I was delegated as the veteran can't, singer. Can't really wow. argue with that. That's amazing. When you kind of think about tone, <laughs> you can't yeah. really argue with that. And and Millie's amazing too. You know the stuff he did with Steelheart, but because he's more of the high screamer guy, as yeah. everybody's known from Steelheart songs, I was more of a like a bellowy belter, like from the the Dio end of the spectrum. And so yeah. we are two different singers on that respect. But even though we both had range, our voices just, they had different characteristics that the producer and director were looking for for their characters. Yeah, you have a warmer tone. So did, did uh, so Miles Kennedy is in the movie and he's the kid that gets handed the mic at the very right. end and basically takes over as the singer for Steel Dragon. Did, does he actually sing on the soundtrack also? Or is it just- I don't know if they use his voice on the soundtrack. I, to be honest with you, I, I'd have to find the album and you know, brush off the dust to see if he's on it. I yeah. don't think so. I, I, think I, double, I double checked that Pariah release. The record was released in 93. So the sessions oh, were okay. in 92. Okay. So you were right on that respect. Yeah, he made, he made, I think he made a couple more records after that. He probably might have, not yeah. many, probably not many. Right, right, right. I think it, he was definitely at the tail end. So that so makes that's sense. that's a great, that's a really great hookup uh, for the, from the Striper camp. For you yeah. just getting in there yeah. with Worman and Worman and you hitting it off. That's, yeah. that's fantastic. It was a great thing. And then, yeah, I, and it was a pleasure working for Tom. But the best part about working for Tom is the respect that he gave me and my knowledge on how to create backing vocals, how to stack the vocals, how to find the harmonies, find the notes. You know, Tom is a great producer in terms of uh, how things feel and getting the vibe. He's not a musical guy. He's not going to say, "Hey, sing the uh, the F sharp above the the D," or sing the 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 you know the root note. He doesn't give you those kind of terms. He just knows when he hears it, it sounds good and it sounds right, or it sounds like shit. And so he, I think he respected my knowledge for the theory side of things. On top of the fact that I worked really fast and very effectively, and that's one of the reasons why I got to do so many records with him. It was a lot of fun. It was a great learning experience for me and another thing to more notches to my resume. Wow. Well, and when you think about Tom's resume, it's like, Oh, geez. Why, yeah. why wouldn't you? Exactly. Oh <laughs> God. Like, yeah. <laughs> wow. You could trade that Nugent. Boy, oh oh my yeah. God. You it goes it. and goes and goes and goes. And, and then for, for others, kick, kicks, you know, yeah. half the bands on monsters on the mountain, monsters of rock. Yeah. Cruise, Tom Worman did that shit. So yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So wow. another footnote that I did not know about you, and I have to give props to our friend Ryan McDaniel, who who tipped me off to this. I didn't realize you were the singer in uh, in Christ the Conqueror. Yes, sir. With uh, Doyle and Jerry from the Misfits. 
Yes, How sir. did that come about? Because that that's an interesting footnote in rock and roll, because I remember seeing the ads for that album and I thought, wow, two of the Misfits have a new project, but they're billing it as sort of a Christian rock band, which seemed kind of odd to me. And then I don't think the the album the, the band didn't last very long. And and I don't even know if the, the album is still in print or, you know, it, it kind yeah. of went away pretty eBay. quick. You can find on eBay. That, well, that's that's my fault, partly. Partially, it's my fault, but it's also partially theirs in terms of they were hoping and expecting that once we did these recordings that I would actually commit to the band. And I I was on a completely different course and I have nothing but love and respect for those two guys, I, especially when I work with them. They were so kind and so giving and just the greatest dudes on the planet. I wow. knew nothing, zero about Glenn Danzig or the Misfits. I knew nothing about that world. I knew wow. nothing about that band. I got a call from a colleague who was working with them to, to lock in a singer for this new project, as you were talking about, called Christ the Conqueror. And for me, it was a session. It was a very well-paid session. They flew me out to, to the East Coast, and uh, I spent a couple of weeks with them knocking this album out. I learned it on the fly. I was literally listening to, to Jerry's uh, kind of mock vocal tracks, guide tracks, and then singing them as we went. And we, we made a great record together, but musically, it was totally not in my wheelhouse. It was not my cup of tea. Um, it's not something I would have wanted to continue with, be between the theme to the the kind of science fiction lyrics and all that i just wasn't in that world at all i wanted to be i in my head i wanted to be in more of like a, a bon jovi uh Dokken, van halen kind of situation after ingve i didn't want to i wanted to get away from the metal neoclassical thing i wanted to just go straight ahead uh commercial hard rock kind of thing and hence the band eyes for instance so yeah this was in 88 that they flew me out i did the record and eventually they did release an ep I don't think they released a full length version. They mixed the whole record. I don't know why they didn't end up releasing the whole thing. But still to this day, when I run into Doyle and Jerry, I, I fucking love these guys. They're just the coolest dudes out there. They're so down to earth and so exactly what they were probably growing up. They, they never changed. And I, I love that about them. But yeah, that uh, that album was just kind of made and and left to, to wow. just kind of to float around and people collecting it along the way. Part It's part of your journey and... You like using that word a lot, Jason. I know. Well, I love the the idea of <laughs> yeah. uh, of being able to like a photo album or shit, an album of songs. Yeah. You know, it's like uh, places you've been. Like I can point yeah. at a tattoo. Oh man, I got this in Florida in '89, and Absolutely. I was on. You know, I know where I was. I know what the room smelled like. I know who I was with. Blah blah blah. It's like a song is like that. It's a smell. Yeah. It's a place. It's a well. Sure. That's part of your whole thing. I love it that more than, more than once you brought up the fact that those two guys uh, were and are the same guys and that you basically fell in love with their, their whole thing and they were so gracious and cool and they let you in. I right. like to say they let you in. they like, here's my heart and my soul. Take whatever sure. you want. Make yourself at home. And, um, and you know, you got a paycheck too. But you yeah. also felt something for these two human beings who are finding their soul through music just like you are sure so i love it that you brought it up that they were super special guys and that now when you run into them they're still super special yeah and, and you got to go back again we're talking about 1988 my my career truly my platform didn't really start till 85 okay i did the the first thing american 84 but people knowing who I was or even hearing me for the first time didn't truly start happening until around 85. So it was yeah. only three years in and, you know, they treated me with the same, with the respect of where I came from. Of course, even then, if, if now it's, it's, con, it's uh, considered or seen as more of like a, a legacy status. Oh, Jeff and the, and Ingve back in the day, those early records and, you know, it's seen differently now than it was then it was still so new. It's like, it's like uh, praising somebody for something that just came out a couple of years ago. You're not quite at that level yet. Right. So, but they still treated me as such then. And, and they treat me the same now. And that's, you know, you know, we were kind of harping on that. Right. How, how would you describe that music? Because I'll, I'll be honest, I haven't heard it, but I, I'm, a big, I'm a big Misfits fan. And yeah, I'm guessing it's a, a bit of a departure from the Misfits. Yeah, it, it certainly was more mainstream metal. It, it had a lot more of the, the Saxon Priest kind of influences 
overall. It wasn't as dark and gothy and as grungy as the Misfits were because the Misfits were kind of a, a gothy punk kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and obviously Glenn wasn't a high singer by any stretch. Mm-hmm. So I, I obviously had more range on that stuff. But I do remember, even though I can't really remember the songs, I do remember it was a lot easier to sing than my normal fare because back then I was I had that natural high voice and I was trying to utilize it on everything. But they didn't necessarily want that sound and vibe for their stuff. And maybe that's a, probably another reason why it wasn't for me. I wasn't ready to to sing in the the lower bellows of uh, of vocal range yet. Yeah, I, yeah wanted they, to, I wanted to be up in that higher echelon of this, uh, of this. range the suggested melodies that that material was giving you were not quite where you want it to be. Right. Right. Yeah. That's so, fair. That's totally fair. I mean, let's hope, and it seems like they would have, of course, a completely appreciated your honesty about where you were as a person. Right. And well, and you know what, and to be fair, they did, everybody was on the same page when I was doing the sessions. They, we all knew I was doing the album just to get the album done. Uh-huh. And the lead singer's name would be Christ the Conqueror. He, he, it was named, it was kind of like a Marilyn Manson or Alice Cooper situation. Okay. The name of the band was the actual name of the singer. Right. And, and I, I don't want to change my name from Jeff Scott Soto to Christ the Conqueror. You know, it's, it's so Why not? it was it was just too conceptualized for me. And I, I was not ready to commit to them. And had I committed to them when we did that record, I think we, it would have turned into something. It would have been more known. It would have been properly released, et cetera. But as far as I was concerned, I was doing a, a really great paying session and I got to meet some lifelong friends out of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you sure did. That's man. I. <laughs> I, I, I'm picking up this vibe on you, man. I really do love the sincerity and the fact that you seem to take something away from all of these experiences. Uh, of You always find the positive, it seems like, out of everything you've been through, and that's what sticks with you, and that's what you're conveying today. And I love the fact that you just kind of have this uh, this radar out for all the positive things. And even so, even though something didn't work, you take what you learn from it, you take the positive aspects of it, you tuck it away and you move on and you carry that with you. And I think it's really cool to hear all this coming from you. I think it's great. I I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not trying to make Jeff uncomfortable here. And this is going to sound really funny, but Jeff Scott Soto is easy to love. He's, uh, he's easy to get along with. He's always been really, really sweet. Hey, remember me? I was in Watchtower. Yeah, yeah. Shut up, kid. Here's an ice tape. Get away from me. That didn't happen. Yeah. It was like, oh, wow, yeah, that was just a couple of years ago. Um, what are you doing now? Well, as a matter of fact, I have a tape. And uh, I never forgot any moment that I've ever stood next to you and chatted with you about rock and roll. So thank you for being thank on you. this silly podcast with us today. Hey, yeah, thank, thank you, man. And it goes back to... I mean, we're, to, not, we're not no, done. We're not I'm done. Just, yeah, I'm no, just no, saying. No, I yeah. <laughs> well, what, what they just said about... That, uh, about finding the positive one of the things when i'm asked in any interview in my uh, talking about in retrospect of my career do i have any regrets and i have none i I can't have any regrets because you learn something from everything if you if there was a negative that came from something you learn from it so you can't regret it because you wouldn't have gotten that lesson from it had you not experienced it yeah and the same goes for all the positives the positives you learn from and of course, you're not going to regret something that was a positive point in your life. You're, you're growing from it. You're utilizing it. And you're moving on with it. But a negative is something you usually want to forget or I wish that never happened. Well, it had to happen for you not for you to know that you never want it to happen again. Right. Right. That's what I'm talking about. You 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 have a great sense of uh, I don't know. You, you've got good radar for finding the good in things. So, yeah, thank you. And that's a great quality, of course. So Jason keeps using the word journey. Um, <laughs> so we've got to talk about journey. Finally. In the, of course. In the other sense of the word, the band journey. Um, you were in that band for maybe a year? 11 months. 11 months. 11 months. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I saw that band when Steve was the singer. So um, Steve uh, Algieri. Perry? Yeah. Not, Algieri. Not, Steve, not Steve Perry. Um, so I do remember his name is like, you, you, the, 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 like Tom and Jerry and you go, Oh, Jerry, Steve, or Jerry, <laughs> Steve, or Jerry. Okay. That's the, that's the guy that I saw. Um, so you came along, uh, after him and I guess he kind of left abruptly. Was it a health reason or something? Or how did you get into journey? Cause he it was seemed- having some vocal issues. Yeah. yeah. 
he was having some political issues at the uh, at the start of the ninth. I'm sorry, nineteen. The, the start of the two thousand and five tour. No, yeah, two thousand six tour. Sorry. Um, he, they noticed that he was having issues, and the days off and the time off weren't helping him kind of cure from them. It was something that was maybe harboring for a while, and he needed a little more time off than they were giving him or than he had. And so they started the run, I think, in Europe. And it, it just got progressively worse when they started. It, they had a, a long run with Def Leppard that they just signed on to. It was, a, it was millions of dollars. It was millions of fans. It was, it was just a, it was a big thing. It was a co-headlining tour with Def Leppard and Journey. And just at the start of it, they, they were thinking, how is Steve going to get through this? Now, the year before that, I had a band with Neil Sean called Soul Circus. And it was a bit of a departure, yes, pun intended, from the journey sound. And that was intentional. You know, as most people know that, you know, Neil was in bad English and hardline. They, and those two things, even HSAS with Sammy Hager, were departures from what he did with journey. And it was intentional in terms of he wanted to do something where his guitar was more of a feature as opposed to the songs and the singer being the feature in terms of, you know, the, the sultry ballads, you know, all that kind of stuff. He wanted more up tempo, gritty kind of stuff. Right. Uh, that band Soul Circus came from the ashes of a, another band called Planet Us that he had with Sammy Hagar, Michael, Michael Anthony, which eventually turned into the chicken foot later. So but that's a whole nother conversation. The uh, they were doing this thing in 2004 uh, called Planet Us. And then um, Sammy and Mike got summoned back to Van Halen. And so Neil was left with all these songs and what to do with. And he put the feelers out and. I stepped in and we started, we had this band called Soul Circus. During Soul Circus, during rehearsals, even during the live set, I would da I would do like a little piano thing and I would dabble into journey songs. And even when we were rehearsals, I would play patiently and stay a while up the, the deeper cuts, not the actual hits. Anybody can go in there and start playing Don't Stop Believing or Faithfully and know it. But I knew the deep cuts. I knew, you know, the stuff from the Infinity album that they never even played live. And he loved the fact that I was so well steeped into journey's catalog and history and he could hear that i could sing it so fast forward to 2006 when uh, jerry was having his issues neil just gave me a call one day he said dude it's it, it's rough out here we might have to send steve home we might need you to, to come and finish out the tour for us i'm like name the date <laughs> let, let me know i'm packed and ready to go and that's exactly what happened i joined the band just after fourth of july of 2006 and we finished up the year with uh, with Def Leppard, and at the end of the year of uh, December of 2006, they they, uh, they deemed me the new permanent singer of the band, and that we were going to record an album, we we're going to do all kinds of stuff. And unfortunately, it was only five months five months after that uh, they let me go. And you know, it's their band, it's their prerogative, it's their idea of what they wanted or expected out of me that maybe I didn't live up to. And I personally, I had a blast doing it, but I personally felt that pressure of filling not only Steve or Jerry's, but the man, Steve Perry's shoes. Yeah. And if you can't do that in a way that's as good, if not better than the original guy, you're going to just get smoked out there. Yeah. And especially a, a situation like Queen, for instance, Queen want to continue. Their singer passed away. Unfortunately, he'll never be able to step back in there and resume his role. Right. Steve Perry's down the street shopping at Walmart and eating at, at a nice Italian restaurant and he's living his life. And as far as people are concerned, he's alive and well and can still sing. Why do you have this Puerto Rican bozo up there who used to sing for Ingrid Malmsteen singing Journey songs? So I had to I had to live through that backlash of who is who is this guy and why is he there? Why don't they just get Steve back in the band? So that pressure mixed with the pressure of singing that catalog and pulling it off as perfectly as you possibly can every night and then year after year after year and then you start stacking on the idea of you know what i'm singing somebody else's legacy i'm not singing mine i think i wouldn't have stayed for more than two or three years anyway i would have probably felt like i want more out of life than just to sing don't stop believing every night for the rest of my life right. and so it kind of worked out for both sides um that we were a bit estranged for uh, a decade and a half and just recently uh, reached out, you know, we're, we're, we're basically, we're not, I wouldn't say pals again, but there's a, there's a narrative. There's a dialogue now between us. I stayed really good friends with, of course, Dean Castronovo and, and some of the other guys in the band, but I was a bit estranged from Neil and John. And I'm just happy to say at least now 
we have a narrative where we're in good terms and, and on positive terms. And this, this is all I want out of the situation. I don't want any bad blood. I don't want any negative energies out there in the, in the world, especially at our age. You know, it, it, now it's time to embrace the things that we've done and to really look back and reflect on them and not have all this bad water under the bridge, you know? Yeah, yeah. Of course. In the time after you finished the tour with Journey, you said there was about five months before you ultimately left. Uh, did you ever get into recording any material with those guys or, or did it not get that far? Yeah, we did one song, but it was it was a song that Jonathan wrote for it was a it was a, a private gig that we did for a, it was a polo match, actually. And they were celebrating the America's birthday. And John basically wrote a song. It was kind of like a history lesson. It's talking about uh, Jamestown and the and the ships came over and they settled in the new land and colonized. It was it didn't sound like a traditional journey song, but it wasn't supposed to be. It was specifically for that event that was only supposed to be performed at that event. And we did that song. We demoed it. And that's that was the end of it. That's the only original song I got to do with them. But man, I, I just remember when I was singing it, I parried the fuck out of it. Nice. If that's even a word, parried. It is. I, yeah. I, it I is, went into yeah. parry mode. I, I, I did a lot of his inflections, a lot of his grammatical vowel sounds, the, the, just the way Perry sang, because he's such a massive influence in me. Phrasing. And the same as, yeah, phrasing, he's phrasing. Dude. Yep. Sam Cooke was his mentor. And before that, Nat King Cole was Sam Cooke's mentor. So I basically learned from all of the masters, including on down the line to Steve. And I wanted to pay homage to what he brought to the band, what he left with that band, because it's such an identifiable signature sound. But when you hear it, you can hear the inflections, but you still hear it's me. So that's what I was trying to get out of that. What's the title of the song? It's called Winds of Freedom. Winds. And you can find it on YouTube. It's been uploaded and there's a just right, just look for uh, Winds of Freedom, Soto and Journey. Wow. Cool, man. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty. Hey, you got to tour with Journey as the front man. That's pretty and, rad. And, and, and it, it, again, it's another pinch me moment. It's yep. I, I had certain dreams in my life, certain goals and asp aspired uh, fantasies when I was growing up. And I remember one of them being someday I want to headline the Hollywood Bowl. And I got to headline the Hollywood Bowl with Journey in front of my high school friends and my family. It was probably one of the highlights of my life. That's awesome, man. Yeah, that's the best. <laughs> I love it. Best. I love it. Let's and go you know, back a little bit. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, sure. Dave. Let's go no, back no, a little. We, tell, a, tell us in a nutshell. Let's talk about Eyes and how many records. I want to say you did two records with Eyes. Is that right? Ish. Okay. <laughs> oh, ish. When, okay. Uh, before Eyes was signed, we the, the drummer came from a, a family that was a uh, pretty well-to-do family, and they helped him finance getting the band together and making the recordings. Uh, the recordings we made were album quality recordings. And we, they hired the best engineers, the best studios. We went, we lived in New York for a month and recorded out there and mixed out there, et cetera. And so that album was completed with the idea that once we got signed, the album's done, we just release it as is. Unfortunately, we got the deal and the, the, uh, the label said, well, we like a few of the songs, but we want a more tougher approach. We want it to be more Def Leppard and Tesla and more in that vein, more so than the Foreigner Journey Survivor vein that uh, the first album was, you know, that album was sounding more towards. So from that, we took those songs that they wanted to, to keep and redid them in a tougher way. And then we did the, the rest of the record. And that was the first official Eyes album. I left the band. And then they decided to release that original version. And in most people's eyes and ears, it was the second album, but it was actually originally the first. And you can hear the differences in the, the sound and even the aggressiveness of what we actually did on the debut album that was actually released. And when they compared to what they, uh, when they put out the first version. Put it on a time frame? Yeah. Between? 1989, 88 okay. or 89, we did the first first yeah. one yeah. and in 1990 we did the debut the, the self-titled eyes album that was in 1990 and that was okay. the same year where i did the first talisman album talisman was the uh the bass player that was with me in Ingve's band marcel jacob okay. and they had their own falling out he moved back to sweden and he he uh locked in with john norham who was out of europe at the time mm -hmm. and john he he co-wrote every song on john norham's first solo album and Marcel was the bass player writer. And then when it was time to do the second album, they had a falling out. 
Marcel took all his songs with him, and that turned out to be the first Talisman album. Wow. Wow. Yeah, and you had a long run with Talisman. What, how long was that? That band was around quite a bit, a decade? 19 years, pretty much from uh, the start to finish, but I, I think there were only seven studio albums, quite a few live albums, but there were a lot of breaks in between, because in the beginning, there was it wasn't even a real band. It was, it was Marcel saying, hey, I've got all these songs, and he hired me to sing on them, and he called the thing Talisman, and it became a hit. It became national charts and everything in Sweden. So then we followed it up with with live shows, which in, the, our first touring guitar player was Jason Beeler, the guy that I'm doing all these acoustic gigs with. The, you know, I just I was just doing it the Monsters on the Mountain. So Jason and I cut our teeth with Talisman together then, and then okay, guys, well that was fun. That was a lot. Good luck, and we'll see you later. And then all of a sudden there was interest in. Uh, demand for a second one and then it just kind of snowballed into being a regular thing and then we had a bit of a hiatus so it's 19 years in all but it was only seven wow. studio records during that time wow so yeah. during that long tenure you were flying over to sweden quite a bit to play yeah. you were living over there at some well kind of yeah it was before unfortunately issue. before the uh the home studios but i think by the time we did the fifth or sixth album that's when i finally had my own home studio where marcel could come over and we could we could basically you know knock out the album right there in my home and then he would take the masters and go have them mixed but um wow. yeah for the first two records it was definitely doing it in sweden the first three i'm sorry mm -hmm. we did it in sweden wow tell tell Man, us you, about you, you're all you, over the place i know right <laughs> globe trotting um you mentioned earlier, and I, I, we can't not talk about this. Tell us about your collaborations with uh, Roger Taylor. And I, did you also collaborate with Brian May from Queen? Well, I, I wouldn't say collaborate. I mean, I, I did a we did we did a few live things together. I met Brian in 99. It was at a Freddie Mercury birthday fan club uh, event in England. And I was asked to come over and sing a couple songs with the the SAS band, which is basically Spike Edney. He's a keyboard player and musical director for Queen. He's got a side thing called Spike's All-Stars, the SAS band. And I would from then be invited to to play every year. They do these Christmas shows in, in England and and Spike would wow. call on all his friends. You know, Graham Goldman from 10CC, Leo Sayre. Um, <sighs> Roger would come play with us. Sometimes Roger Daltrey. Uh, Brian would come and sit in. So it was, it was a really cool, fun thing that I was doing with them. Can but I say I something? Say something. Yes. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> I met Brian in that scenario in 99. I got to sing Dragon Attack with him, with Spike and, and those guys. And then wow. uh, the next time I jammed with them, I finally got to meet Roger is when Queen got the star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame in 2001. And they invited me to sing a few songs for an after party jam that they were going to do. That's why I finally got to meet Roger. And that's where my relationship kind of flourished with the two of them. Uh, now we fast forward after doing a few appearances together here and there, just, you know, jams and, and cover songs and sometimes their own songs. Um, it was in 2012 when they were, they announced this queen extravaganza, which is the queen tribute album sponsored and run by queen. And Roger was pretty much the, he was the ringleader of that whole thing. Brian was kind of in the background, but he, he gave his stamp of approval. And they had three singers that they they chose to, to be a part of that. And Roger called me at the end. Of, I, I think it was at 2011. Yeah. The end of 2011, he asked me if I would be so willing and inclined to be the rock representative of the Queen Extravaganza, because the guy that the main guy that was there, Mark Martell, dead ringer for Freddie's voice, just sounds just like Freddie. But they they felt they needed more of a, an edgier side to the rock side when they were doing things like tie your mother down or stone cold crazy yeah uh, mark is great for the more pop and uh the pompous you know the, the nostalgic and the the novelty songs mark was fantastic on it and stuff like don't stop me now etc but when it came to the heavier stuff i was the rock representation nice. for that uh, queen extravaganza so i did nice. i did that run for a few months and then uh and then i realized the same thing as my thought process and journey i don't want to be just seen as a guy singing somebody else's legacy and did and i did i that. see and that's i respect the shit out of that uh hmm. did i my eye did my eyes deceive me that no. i saw you singing backup yes. on american idol with yes, queen sir. 
That was our debut performance. I told my wife, we're sitting in the living room. I told my wife, I know that dude right there. I know that dude. Uh, that, yeah. that dude right there. And I there, remember I this thing. I remember distinctly thinking, oh, man, of all songs they could have chosen, they, they could have made it maybe because it's such a short spot, a short slot that we were filling that we can only do so long of a song. Mm, a minute. Like, why couldn't it be something where we all shine? Yeah. And thankfully, Brian came up with an alternate ending to Somebody to Love. That's a song we did that picks up at the end. The band kicks in and, and Roger and Brian came out, but he wanted to be more higher energy. And so Mark got to stay at the piano and I got to take over the, the like the lead vocal uh, vamping ad libs and stuff. So I, I got a, I could sneak in a little bit of yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I was basically backing vocal Jeff. Wow. Well, dude, I mean, come on. Well, you, you know, you know what? Ryan May and Roger That's Taylor. Right. <laughs> and I remember you, I won't call it hamming it up, but you were v being, uh, me. And, and no surprise you were you were it was professional it was professional and for that audience for you know we know who who watches american idol yeah. i don't normally watch american idol i happen to be watching that night my wife had wow. it on i can blame it on her but i'm glad that i saw that because you were there and i was like oh my god it's fucking jeff and and you were clapping and you were smiling and you were it was very uh you were appropriate to that audience and that's just another sign of a pro yeah. i'll take it you know everything yeah, i do and everything i've can. done is it's you know we're, we're talking from all the experience and talking from all the dreams and aspirations and so yeah it's all par for the course as i keep saying it's uh everything that i've been longing for and then dreaming for and working for so that's just another situation another payoff so to speak of all the time and persistence well, you know your you know your place when you're when you're sort of like in someone else's house. You know your place as a vocalist, and that's why your phone keeps ringing. Yeah, <laughs> even though you always jump ship because because <laughs> well, it's not really your true dream. You know, you want to yeah. create your own legacy. Respect, respect, and respect all the way. I gotta be fair to yeah. exactly what you're saying there. When I jump ship per se, part of when it's my decision, when it's my decision to break up with the girl, when I, when it's time for me to move on from something, it's mainly because there are elements missing that musically that I want to do or stylistically. One of the worst situations in, in, in terms of being influenced come from being so influenced by Queen. It's the, the greatest thing you can get and greatest thing you can have in your arsenal but it's also the worst thing you can have because you're never satisfied. You're never complete. Yeah. You always want that band. They tackled everything from opera to rock, to blues, to jazz, to disco, to funk, to metal, to you name it. They tackled all of it and they conquered it all. Yep. Now you're inspired and influenced by that. You want that for yourself. So if I'm, if and I'm, I'm only using this as a, a, a general term, if I'm in a band like ACDC, the blinders are like this. You know what your role is. You know what the music is. And you're basically just going to stay that course. Yeah. My yeah. blinders go like this and I can't stay. I can't just put the blinders on and, and stay on one and stay in one lane. I want to go on every lane. I want to go on every alternate route. I want to take paths, hills, valleys, freeways, byways, tollways. I want to go in tunnels. That's my, that's how I pursued my career. I want to be able to do it all. And, and it's funny, even now, when I think about it, I used to actually get, blasted for being in too many situations and doing too many different styles. And people would say, if Jeff just chose one lane, he'd have a bigger career. He could have a bigger name for himself and be in one band. And then I, and then you look at now, you look at all of our contemporaries, they're in multiple super groups and different bands and different things. I was blasted for it once and now everybody's doing it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I know all about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah jason's got a few projects mm -hmm. and god bless him for it 25 us, 25 yeah well uh, you'll you'll add another one before the day's over so i maybe, don't have a gig I got to say, like, one, one of the uh, one of the ones I, I got to see is uh when you did the uh, the thing with portnoy the uh, the rush thing oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. he didn't even yeah. tell me you just gave me a copy of the dvd he sent me a bunch of like you know here's a bunch of stuff if you're bored you want to just to have it sure I, of course i wanted to hear there i want to hear mike playing rush i want to hear him play neil peart 
And I popped another, what? Jason singing. He didn't tell me Jason was singing that. Yeah. And it was great. Thanks, man. That really was fun. enjoyed that. That was fun. Was- I can't believe that was in 2005. Crazy. Man. That's wacky. That's awesome. No, you you yeah. really did the you did the material justice. It, thanks. It was an honor. It was an honor. And you know how uh, Portnoy wrote. I, I sometimes call them fan letters just so I can feel special. But uh, Portnoy and uh, they were called Majesty at the time. Right. All the dream, the original Dream Theater right. guys. Uh, Mike wrote me handwritten pen pal letter wow. in 1986 or something wow. when those guys were at Berkeley yeah. and I was like whoa this is crazy these guys and he sent me a stack of majesty tapes and I gave them all to the watchtower guys nice and that was like yeah late 80s and then a couple years later it's like I'm he's in dream theater and I'm in dangerous toys and he used to say we're we're in the DT bands yeah yeah dream theater dangerous toys right so, right right yeah, kind of a, an interesting little like how weird things go yeah you know it's like getting a letter from portnoy saying that he loves a band that you're in when you're 18 or 19 years old yeah and then years go by and this kind of like long distance relationship kind of like blossoms and you, you kind of you know i got your name here and i got his name here and i got you know it's kind of it's kind of relative to my journey so yeah, that word again. There it yeah, is again. I know. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm so but, but yeah, when the when the phone rings and it's someone that you respect, you sure. have to you have to find any way that possible to say yes. Sure. Because and it's, want, it's funny. You, uh, I've got two things that when we speak, we sidebar things that pop in our heads, and we want to let them out before we lose them. But one of the things is uh, Mike telling me how they used to do I'll See the Light Tonight in Majesty. And then Mike nice. said the first time he saw me sing was at, at the Beacon Theater in New York with Talis opening up. So now you fast forward decades later and he's in a band with the bass player from Talis and yep. the singer from Ingve. And, 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 it, and now going back to exactly what you're talking about, getting the call from Mike Portnoy, you, you find a way to say yes. It's, it's kind of like when you go casting for a, a part in a movie, a, can you uh, can you swim? Yes. Can you ride a horse? Yes. Can you ride a motorcycle? Yes. You say yes to everything and you figure it out later. <laughs> <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> and uh, my band Soto was opening up for Winery Dogs in 2016 in South America. And and Dave Z, my bass player, God rest his soul, was very good friends with Mike. I'd only met Mike a handful of times at that point, but I was really good friends with Billy and, and of course, Richie Cotson. So Mike was kind of the the, the final link to as far as being buddies and all that stuff, he was, a, he was the last one out of that group. But uh, I remember doing the shows and I could see Porto on the side of the stage, watching the first, the you know, first couple songs of pretty much every show. I thought, okay, he's just showing that he's supporting Dave and, and he's friendly with us, whatever. That's cool. But I, what I realized later is he was actually scouting me out for the sons of Apollo thing. Mm-hmm. Cause it was at the end of 2016 on my birthday, he, uh, he gave me a call and said, listen, I'm, I'm calling you to tell you what your birthday present is. I'm thinking, oh, cool. He's going to give me like one of his old signature drum kits or something fun like that. He <laughs> says and he was telling me about this group that he had called PSMS with Billy, my, my Tony McAlpine and Derek Sherinian. But there was an instrumental thing and they did. They'd done two instrumental records and kind of two instrumental tours or runs or whatever. The next album they wanted to put vocals on. And I was the guy. There was no auditioning. There was no uh, let's see what the chemistry is like. Let me none, none of that. Mike said, "You're the guy. If you want it, the gig is yours." And without hearing one note, without even knowing what we're going to do musically, or even wondering, "Shit, can I pull this?" I mean, what if they want me to sing, you know, sixteen over nineteen time? I, I, I have to do math just to be able to sing a song. I just said yes. I said yes before he could even finish the sentence. I said, I'm totally in. To be in a band with Mike, Derek, and, uh, and and Billy, of course I'll do it. And it was later when they got Bumblefoot in the mix, that's when it turned into Sons of Apollo. Yeah. Billy, of course, is Billy Sheehan, um, amazing bass player. Sons of Apollo, I'm glad you brought that up because, they're, I mean, dude, you talk about talent. Oh, my God, that, that band is just ridiculous. And uh, so what's the, what's the status on that band? Because I, I feel like I read something somewhere where – you were gonna go. You were gonna tour, and then Sheehan had to uh, bow out for for some reason. Um, 
were you able to continue or what's the status of the band right now? Oh yeah. There's uh, for, for his own personal reasons, you know, Billy's uh, he, he's decided that he doesn't want to partake in the, what's the word, the, uh, the mandates that are necessary to be able to go into certain countries. And I'll just leave it at that. That's his prerogative. I respect him. We respect him. We love him. But unfortunately the South American tour, which we just completed last week or a week and a half ago, we had to do it with or without Billy, with or without anyone who was not able to do it with us because that tour was booked originally in 2020, rebooked again, rebooked again, rebooked again. There was a lot of money lost along the way. There were a lot of fans disappointed, and a lot of fans pissed off, a lot of uh, venues all across the board. We had to pull it off this time around, and we were hoping mandates would change. We, we were gutted that we had to do anything without any original members, but unfortunately that was the scenario that was uh, you know brought to us. We had to pull these gigs off. Um, and, and that's it, that's, you know, at this point, the band is dormant. It's it's going to be sitting for a while to, to see what the next steps are because Winery Dogs just finished a new album. Uh, Derek is doing his own stuff. I'm all over the map doing my stuff. So Sons of Apollo is like anything else. When you have members from different bands and different situations, you have to work around those situations. And after COVID, everybody's trying to play catch up with all the other stuff that they were doing besides Sons of Apollo. Yeah. We're, we're going to have Billy on the show in the next couple of days because uh, he's he's uh, basically revived Talus. Uh, right, right, right. Got an album coming out. Uh, so so you had to move forward without Billy. Who the hell do you get to replace Billy Sheehan? <laughs> it's a very, very well-known band in Brazil called Angra. They've been around for a long time. And yeah. every single member in that band are just monsters. The monster musicians, uh, the last guitar player, Kiko Loreo, is now in uh, Megadeth. Yeah. They, okay. These guys, they they all went on to other things. Uh, the band continues now, and the bass player from this band, Felipe Andreoli, he's uh, phenomenal. And, and the funny thing is, the way I presented to the guys, if we had to go this route, and when I presented the idea of using Felipe, I said, this guy's so good, He's in a Dream Theater tribute band just for kicks, just for for a goof, because <laughs> because he can play that stuff and he can play it so effortlessly and, and easily. That's when I that's that's when everybody was convinced that he would be able to pull this stuff off. Wow, wow, man, yeah. I mean, I can imagine trying to keep something like that to sustain it when you've got so much talent and everybody's yeah. got so many other demands. I mean. The, the 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 players in that band are just world class, incredible. Oh, absolutely! And and every what everybody brings to the table. I mean, Bumblefoot. That's just a that's an outer body experience when you watch him play. When you hear him play, he yeah. truly is. Just when you think you've heard it all and seen it all, and especially me, you know, I, I, when you look at my resume from from Ingve to Neil Sean to Brian May and all these great, great, great guitar players and pioneers, really trailblazers. Mm -hmm. You think, okay, I've seen and done it all. And then along comes Bumblefoot. You just say, oh, my God, it's just, it's mind altering. Yeah, I was uh, <laughs> lucky enough to to collaborate on, on, a, on a covers album on the uh, the Ellison No Covers oh, right. record. Um, what did you sing on there? Uh, I sang uh, Free Riff Will Raff. Burning. Oh, nice. I did, I did Riff Raff with, uh, with Bumblefoot. Okay um dave lombardo from slayer on drums on Riff Raff. oh that so that, that, that hacks that's pretty yeah <laughs> that guy can't play. yeah oh that guy yeah <laughs> he's, he's, I, don't quit your day job right i think he played i think he played uh played that that song with his teeth i think he tied his arms both arms behind his i think he just imagined it. it he just he just sat on his easy chair at home imagined it and the drums were done that's how good he is. Pretty, pretty much yeah. um but uh, it, speaking of Ellison, did, weren't you in a, did you do something with him? Was there a record was going to come out? We're uh, getting to it. You, nice segue, dude. The get, get, thank first you. single video was released yesterday, as a matter of fact. What? Uh, yesterday. Really? Ellison Soto, the name of the album is called Vacation in the Underworld. Uh, it's coming out okay. October 7th. And wow. I literally, before we did this, I had to do some promo stuff to uh, promote. We're doing two shows in Italy because the three of the uh, the touring li lineup of the band are in Italy. So to just to kind of keep costs down and everything, Dave and I have to be in Europe anyways. We chose Italy as kind of a gathering point. Good. We're going to do a couple shows to kind of launch the band and show everybody that's a real thing. 
Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's coming out Rat Pack, Rat Pack Records October 7th. And uh, I believe it's coming out worldwide it's, as well. So that's, uh, that's Todd Latoury's label. His, Todd yes. Latoury's solo and record. Doug came out. And Ping yeah, is on yeah, it yeah, now. Yeah. And what, a cool, yeah. what a cool roster they have. Yeah. And, and you know crazy. what? David, David reached out to me during the pandemic. He was co-writing with a bunch of different people collaborating. He was still Megadeth at the time. Yeah. So he was known for writing a lot of songs that were ending up on other people's records. And mm -hmm. so he reached out and said, Hey dude, I got this song. Your voice would be perfect for it. You know, I'll pay a couple hundred bucks just to demo it for me. And he did. And then he loved it so much. He said, hey dude, I got another song. Pay me a couple hundred bucks for that. He just kept hiring me for songs. After the third one, I said, dude, you don't have to pay me. We're all locked down. We're all at home. I'm, I, I, it's a pleasure just to create with you. And, and now at that point I was co-writing with him. So you're yeah. not going to pay me for something we're doing together. It's, it's a collaborative yeah. effort. Yeah. And so from that, we recorded something like 15 or 16 songs. Damn. Without, we weren't even thinking about it. We just realized, Oh my God, look how many songs we got. And yeah. from there we was like, maybe we should take this. Maybe we should make this a thing and see if there's interest in it. And let's, that's, let's talk that's about the collaboration. When, when Dave says like says, sends you a song for you to work on some parts for you guys are texting and emailing or phone yeah. calling or whatever. And then he's sending you a track. That's like a right. rough mix. It's got a guitar, a bass yeah. and drums on it. And you're writing lyrics and popping a vocal on top of it. How about this? Check this out. Da, sure. da, da, da. Is that the way it, I mean, that's kind of normal nowadays, right? Right. That's how I more, do it. That's... He, he sent me more complete items. Like the lyrics were already written. Oh, he, shit. He, he kind of faux demoed them, you know, like give me like a, a faux guide vocal or or somebody else would be singing on it that I would take from that and change the lyrics or change some of the melodies. And then I started adding lyrics to things. And then I was starting to write full versions of songs. OK, good. Including yeah. melodies. And it, it just turned into such a fun collaboration with no there was no. <clears throat> There was no end game behind it. We were just doing it because we had massive respect for one another and we yeah. enjoyed what we were turning out. And it was only from that that we realized we're not going to give this to somebody else to redo and, and release for themselves. We're going to put this out ourselves. Yeah. And that's what that turned into. Amazing. Wow. Is that like that? Uh, is that sort of like scenario, collaboration scenario um, similar or exactly the same as when somebody else is wanting you on a project do you do you record and cut vocals for project songs like that in your own home studio everything is done here and everything is different some some want me to collaborate some want my input some want me just to verbatim you just basically sing with my voice and tone over what they've already created yeah and i'm good with all of the above i love tapping into all these resources it goes back to that whole queen thing i was talking about i get to i i'm so lucky and humbled in my life that I, I get to sing so many different things, genres, avenues, lanes, and, and, and I get to do it because it just continues to add to my own arsenal of what yeah. I'm about. I get to expand my arsenal of what I'm about based on working with other people. And yes. that was that's another extension working with David. You know, we, we had no end game behind it, but it turned out to be so good. We had to release this. Yes. Well, congrats uh, on that. that and thanks. Ellison yeah, Soto. I, so we'll have to remind listeners before we wrap up. We'll have to remind them on the release date and the, and the title of the album. I'm gonna. Yes, it makes but, me want to reach out to Dave and and uh, I'm assuming his number is the same. Uh, he's texting get, me literally as we're talking right now. He's, really? He's well, tell him that, tell him that I said hi and that I want to have him on the show. Perfect. Yeah. yeah I'm sure great. he'd love to do it. That'd be great. I wanted uh, to talk about uh, Trans Siberian Orchestra. Uh, yes. That's the last thing I have here on my notes. Okay. Um, uh, so the, the Trans-Siberian Orchestra has a reputation for hiring amazing singers. I, I don't think there's ever been a slouchy singer in that. And musicians, that, not just singers. Music, yeah, right. Yeah, top notch all across the board. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and yeah, I was going to say the singers are great, but what those guitar players? I don't know. <laughs> No, it, Alex Holnick, Al Petrelli. Yeah, really does the, yeah. Why are they? Why are they having? Oh that? yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It has a reputation for hiring the best of the best. And now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I I tend to that that band comes on my radar every year around the holidays. So is it is it kind of exclusively a holiday type thing, 
or does it is it more is it ongoing elsewhere in the world and we only see it typically in the states around the holidays tell what's it like touring with that project because i i feel like it's it tours in chunks of time rather than going yeah. out like a typical tour we tour at the end of every year basically november december the beginning of the holiday season those are the only months you can actually get away with doing a seasonal band or seasonal story songs etc like tso um rewinding back to the founder uh, that's that just got the whole thing up and running paul o'neill god rest his soul we lost him the same year we lost david z um he started this as an offshoot from sabotage that right. he was the mm-hmm. main, main creative force for the big sabotage records he was a producer co-writer and basically he kind of formed these guys into what sabotage became before they actually split up so from that the ashes of sabotage were the beginning stages of tso because of their rendition of carol of the bells which they appropriately retitled Sarajevo, uh, the the song on the uh, sabotage album it was basically an instrumental version of that carol of the bell song but with metal guitars underneath from that it just sprang it just lit up it, it lit up radio and it turned into Paul writing a whole story behind that particular track and other songs that support it. And that was Christmas Eve and other stories. I think that came out in 95 or 96. I'm not exactly mm-hmm. sure when the first TSO album was out. And from that, it just lit up. People really, really, they, they, they connected with it immediately. So they decided, well, let's, let's do some live shows. The, the first tour for TSO was a week long with a box truck and some a few like like cans and, and a few marshals in the back and when i think even petrelli was driving the u-haul and it was it was just a they, they got a couple theater gigs it was really low budget low key but that's when the idea of dressing up in in suits and tuxedos playing rock guitars you know guys in long hair and tuxedos was kind of a cool thing back in 96. yeah so it snowballed it as the years went on it snowballed into a tour which only one band couldn't cover the entire uh, country. They, they, everybody wanted this band, but you can't do Christmas or seasonal songs in June or April. You can only do them in November, December. And that's when they had to split and create two bands. You have an East Coast and a West Coast production. I'm part of the West Coast production. Now, I met Al Petrelli, uh, who's the musical director, and uh, he's one of the driving forces. He was also part of Sabotage. I met him when he was playing uh, guitar for Alice Cooper back in 1990 mm-hmm. when I was in Talisman. We sparked up a friendship then. And through the through the years, we we'd see each other, we'd run into each other, catch up and all that. He phoned me literally the day after I got fired from Journey in 2007. And he said, hey, remember that thing I told you about? I was doing trans Orchestra. Um, my boss, Paul O'Neill, we're, we're doing a non seasonal album where it's it's basically it's original material, but it has to do with a completely different story and nothing to do with Christmas or seasonal stuff. And he's tried every singer on the planet. I told him about you and he wants to meet you. Can, can we fly you down to Tampa, meet Paul and, and see if this works out. And of course I was at the heels of being bummed that I wasn't in journey anymore. I'm like, absolutely. I, any excuse to go hang out with Al, I'll take it. Yeah. Go out to Florida. And this is one of my favorite stories. And this is one of the most amazing human beings on this planet that I've ever met. And to this day, will hold it to the, my last breath is Paul O'Neill. I remember spending seven hours with him in the studio. He played me one of the songs that he wanted to hear me singing on. But before I went in to go sing it, he gave me a whole, he gave me the whole outline story of what this album Night Castle was going to be about. He told me what my character, the voice has to be based on this kind of life. This is where I, I, I'm not a musical theater guy, but this is where I learned how to step into the shoes of somebody else's life and actually portray it in the in the form of song. And that's what they do in musical theater. You're basically performing as a character, not yourself. Had he not given me this information, I would have gone in, I would have sung that song like Jeff Scott Soto. Right. But with seven hours of history lessons, of the story outline, of the, the, the main character that I'm singing for and his life that I was singing for, he gave me so much data and input that after seven hours, he finally sent me in the studio and goes, Make make him sing, boss, and I, I sang him the song, and boom, I got the gig. That's seven so hours that, of d- dress rehearsal. Exactly, and it's a, the amazing thing. My audition was based on how much I soaked up the story 
and the character that he was presenting to me, not how well I could sing or how high I could sing or how badass I could sing. It was all about me getting into, stepping into the shoes of that character and delivering that story. Wow. Man, but he amazing. sounds like an amazing coach. It, it was amazing. It was a great experience. It was one of the hardest things I'd ever done because he was very particular, but it, there was one, <laughs> we finished all five songs on the record, a month gone by, they were starting to mix the record. I think I was in England at the time. And he said, uh, boss, I need you to come into the studio. There's everything about this last song that's going to be on the record is perfect. But the very last word you say on there, it's it's kind of lying flat with me. It's like, it's got to be like time or something like it had to match the performance and the levels of what I gave, the emotion I gave on the rest of the song. He goes, I need you to fly in just for that one word. Wow. I said, you, you, oh, wait, well, you must be kidding me. This is before I, I got to understand the genius that was Paul O'Neill because I, I learned later how and why he had certain, he had his way of thinking and, and, and working. So I flew in and I gave him like five versions of that final word. And he was now over the moon. He goes, now we have another problem. That final word, that final performance is such God. That, that was his term. When something's great, he says, that was God. It was really great. He goes, that was double God. He goes, that nice. final performance was so double God, it's now dwarfing the rest of the song. So I boss, I need you to now take that energy and give me a couple more versions of that. And I, we did it. And that, it was just, it was magic. It really was. Yeah. He needed, he needed you one more time to <laughs> yeah. oversee what he was, uh, what was making him lose sleep. Yeah. And he, he really brought something out of me that one, I didn't know I had. And two, I had no interest in, I've wow. never ever been interested in doing Broadway or being in a, is in a musical, that kind of thing. And TSO is very geared towards musical theater. He likes to call it rock theater. Mm -hmm. And again, God rest his soul. We lost him prematurely. I, I wish he, I wish he was still with us today, but he's still with me in so many details, even doing the sons of Apollo album. There was the, the second album. There's a, there's a song on there called uh, new world today. Oh no, there's another one called King of delusion. And there's a breakdown, which is a piano and a sultry vocal. And instead of just singing it the way Perry would have done it or the way Tyler would have done it or Freddie would have done it, I sang it the way Paul O'Neill would have directed me had he been in the studio with me for that particular part of that song. Wow. I learned something from him that I would have never had without working with him. Wow. Yeah, he opened a box inside Absolutely. your head and your heart. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. And man, it's everything that I do, every, every aspect of what I do is all about paying homage to my influences and, and, and showing what I got from them. And if I could leave that for somebody else to actually take from me, I mean, that's, that's the biggest dream for me over boats and houses and, you know, elaborate financial and rewarding things. My biggest reward is leaving something behind that somebody takes from and actually puts, you know, puts into play later. Yeah. The rest of all that material shit is all bullshit. Right. Yeah. Well, I think your legacy is 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 in very good hands. Uh, There's you know. that word again, legacy. <laughs> hey, <laughs> we get to talk about it together, and you know, you guys are helping me extend it. You know, the, uh, when doing these kinds of things, it's just another version of sharing who you are and what you are. And without being able to share that, who's going to give a fuck otherwise? Right. So I'm glad for people like you. I'm glad for you know, I've had such a long standing, even though we're not close, but a long standing friendship with Jason for the past 37 years that allows us to do something like this and continue spreading the word and continue spreading the music. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Well, we, we, I really learned a lot today and I really do appreciate you being on the show because you're, you're, you know, I looked over your resume when I was preparing for, for this episode and it was just mind boggling how many things you've done and the quality of each and every one of those things is, you know, is off the charts, too. So you got a lot to be proud of and uh, and, and you come across as a really genuine human being and uh, you deserve all the success you've had, man. I appreciate that. I brag on I, you. I, I, any, I, I, any chance yeah. I get, I brag on you, Jeff. Any oh, chance that I get. rules. Yeah. It's all, all my life. I just I always wanted to just remain who I was, you know, that 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 hungry kid who just dreamed of, you know, of being a rock star. All those things are still in me. I still have that hunger and that desire. But the main thing is I, I still want to be a good person. I don't want, 
I don't want hatred. I don't want anybody to dislike me. I don't want anybody to to talk shit about me. I just I I want to be liked as much as I like people, and and that's that's how I want to leave my legacy. Yeah, one of the things I enjoy about doing this podcast is you know I I'm a, I'm a complete rock and roll nerd, so of course I just love talking to people that have made a name for themselves and have records that I own in my collection, or I've seen you in concert when you were 19 years old. Uh, I enjoy that aspect of the conversation. And uh, Jason will tell you, I've said this before, once in a while we get a guest on the show where I walk away from the episode feeling like I got to know the human being and I really like the human being I got to know. And you're one of those guys, man. So oh, thank you, man. So thank you for sharing so much with us. Appreciate that. I think Jeff will like hearing this part of it. If I'm kind of talking to Dave, Dave just kind of confirmed this, but I feel like we've been on a roll lately dave on having like these guests on here who we kind of know very little about and then and then the episode lasts like three plus hours or some yeah. shit or just you know whatever longer than the 90 minutes that seem to be the attention span that human brains can take <laughs> i'm telling you like todd latori it's like i that guy is so nice. He hung out with us for hours and just yeah, talked yeah. about anything and everything. And it was just great. Oh, great dude. I love we, for, we forgot we were doing a, a rock and roll yeah. nerd podcast yeah, right. just because exactly. we were talking about technique and rock. it was really cool talking to him. Uh, I think Dave sort of like became sort of fly on the wall listening to me and Todd talk about technique and breathing and right. mouth shapes and nasal tones and you know all, just all of this sure. whole thing and and dave i've heard him say 50 times whoa wow well todd it's was one cool. of those guys hey, jeff jeff is is similar to todd yes, that's that why respect. i brought up todd yeah, yeah it's yeah. like uh uh you know i was already had a lot of respect for todd and and his success and his his vocal abilities and all that but I, I left the episode, left the, the show being a fan of Todd, the human being. And now yeah. now I'm a fan of Jeff, the human being. So. And people Thank who you. work and people who work hard like Jeff and Todd. Yeah. yeah. Work hard. Guys, I, I'm going to need your I'm going to need your Venmo account so I can send you the money for the, all these nice words you're sending my way. Like, <laughs> that shit doesn't come for free. <laughs> <laughs> this well, one's on the, this, this one's on the house since you were so kind yeah. to, to join us. It's, it's, uh, it's my pleasure. It's it, it, it's, I, was, it's, I was so happy when Jason asked me if, I, if I'd want to do it again. It was one of those things I said yes before he finished the sentence. Yeah. Well, well we're, thank we're you. yeah, we, we appreciate you and we're, we're extremely happy to, uh, to be able to just have this time together Um with each other and just talk about art and music and kind of bro down a little bit. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, people seem to really take to the podcast because, you know, the numbers are not astronomical. We don't have a million followers. Right. Um, but what people take from this is different than somebody on a podcast, maybe talking shit. Yeah, right. or actually reviewing something and giving their full-blown opinion about something when that, that's not really what the show is about. Right. Uh, their numbers are higher than ours because this is like a, a hangout and a bro down and we talk about things. And sure, there's some opinions here, but it's very, uh, very much a positive uh, yeah. outlook. And, uh, and yeah, we just... We just love learning about, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll use the term loosely, not to freak you out, heroes, right? People, people who we you. respect. And uh, well, just the feelings thank, are mutual. thank you so much for being here today on the Talk Louder podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for letting me blab and just keep gabbing away. <laughs> I, I apologize if my stories are long winded, but no. sometimes. The devil in the details is uh, uh, they're more important than just saying, yeah, I got the gig and, and then I lost the gig. Right. That's yeah. why we have the show. We want the details. We a love perfect, it. A perfect the, guest. A perfect yeah, guest. Yeah, absolutely. Jeff, awesome. thank you so much for joining us today. On behalf of my co-host, Jason McMaster, I'm Metal Dave Glessner, along with our very special guest today, Jeff Scott Soto on the Talk Louder podcast. Talk Louder.